Hi, I'm Alex Sabo, CEO of Jomar Life Research. Do you know that show Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee where Jerry Seinfeld drives around in collector's automobiles and meets up with other famous comedians over some coffee to tell jokes? Well, this show is exactly like that. Not. Nah. Well, first of all, I don't have a collectible car. All I've got is this beat-up 1990 Mazda that I borrowed from a friend. Frankly, it's a real shitbox. Second, I know some famous comedians, but unfortunately, they don't know me. Lastly, we won't offer coffee on this show, but cheese may make an appearance. More on that later if you stick around. But this show will offer an opportunity to meet some of Australia's most accomplished biological scientists as they spell out how they made their key discoveries and share some stories from the lab. Welcome to Scientists in a Shitbox Spelling It Out. Let's go meet our first guest, one of Australia's most renowned researchers. The dogs too, of course. He has the greatest dogs. Oh, hello. Not... Hello. Well, hello there. Sir Gus Nossel. Good to see you. Such a pleasure to see you. Thank you for joining us for this activity. It's a great pleasure. I've been looking forward to oh, it. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Watch the step here. Fine and dandy. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's a diesel. We have to wait for the glow plug to, to warm up the engine. <laughs> <laughs> this is old school. must have worked hard to find a car as prestigious as that. <laughs> it actually belongs to a, uh, an oncologist at Peter Mac. I'm not a very successful oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> a very public spirited uh, oncologist. You're probably most well known to the general public for being the the director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute for more than 30 years, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Indeed. Yeah. But your original claim to fame and, and probably what laid, led to your taking that position was you performed a very important experiment. You, you did the experiment that really provided the experimental proof, um, as it were, of Burnett's selection theory. Very, very much of the uh, credit belongs to two people other than myself. My boss was Mac Burnett. Mac Burnett loved theorizing and he was pretty good at it too. Mac uh, had devised a new theory of the immune response, a very profoundly different new theory of the immune response. What is the most remarkable The most remarkable single thing is the sheer number and diversity of antibodies that your body can make. How can such diversity of protein production antibodies and proteins, how can such diversity of antibody protein production exist? The theories of antibody formation, the only thing that people can think of to explain this diversity was that the antigen came in and the antibody molded itself against that template of antigen, much as some soft plastic would mold itself against a dye. <laughs> now, that theory is not right, and it, it, it goes against the idea that proteins are only made at the dictates of DNA as transcribed into RNA. Burnett proposed this clonal selection theory Antibodies might be natural substances already genetically inherent in the person. The genes from pre-existing and all of the antibodies.
Dutch had to do was to amplify vastly the production of that already genetically present antibody. So I said to my dear boss, look, I can test this damn thing. He had never ever thought of testing it for an extent. This is my theory, but you know, and no way of testing. I said, I can prove to you that one cell from an animal that's been immunized with two or more antigens will either make one or the other antibody or it'll make both. That's a very simple yes or no answer. It's got to be one of the two. Well, there was one little thing I hadn't figured out. The incident was not very rich. Mac Burnett, being of Scottish ancestry, <laughs> ate and spending money. He ate and spending money. So the only binocular microscope in the Hall Institute was Mac Burnett's own microscope, which was quite good. All the other microscopes were single eyepieces. If you can imagine what it's like, you know, down looking at a, down a microscope with just one eyepiece, not two. Not very easy if you do it four or five hours a day. Secondly, would you believe that there was no microscope that had any client in my piece other than you? <laughs> These were all very You had to look eyepiece. straight down. Look straight down. But anyhow, that was a good story. So it was a test of doing this work, it was a test of your stamina, among exactly. like other things. Yeah. Bacteria, to be able to be seen, and particularly to see them swimming, required a form of illumination that is known as dark field. Dark field so that the surrounds look dark and the lit up bacteria are very brilliant electric yellow colour. And a dark field condenser is a very well known thing. There's nothing special about it, except the multiple last all is you didn't have one. <laughs> so I figured out I'm not going to be, allow myself to be daunted by this. And I figured out that if I took out the condenser of the microscope, which is the part that focuses the light from above the leaf, and inserted a penny, a large Australian <laughs> penny, in its place, I could manipulate the penny in such a manner that an arc of light shot up, which was a sort of a fair imitation of dark field illumination. Can I ask, can I, sorry to interrupt, can I ask you how you thought to use a penny? Would, would any other, would any other coin Any work? other thing of a sufficient size, <laughs> but would have had to be about the size of the condenser. Right, okay, so it was just any so old, six any six old six coin, months. it didn't have six to be... Uh, I couldn't have done it in uh, 2018. Uh -huh. uh, there would have been no coin big enough. Well, fortunately for me, the results of the study were very, very clear cut. Uh, it was quite clear that one cell always made that. One could say that your clonal uh, selection experiment was a singular discovery. <laughs> well, it was a single cell and the number of times that my wife and my family, Josh me and oh, Gus, he's only, he's only got to work with single cells. They don't ask him any questions about <laughs> peptic ulcers or brain tumors. Yeah, he only knows about single cells. things that I, I know that I recall about this or reading about this when I um, studied this when I was an immunologist myself, a young immunologist. And one thing that astonished me is that you did this so early in your PhD studies. It was literally in the first year or so. Yeah, was no, it not? Year no. Yeah. And um, and the, the second thing was that this was already your second nature paper. You you were one year into your one and a half years into your PhD studies, and you you've gotten a second nature paper. Uh, I guess one might say that from the beginning, uh, publishing important papers was in your nature. <laughs> well, it was in my DNA, maybe. <laughs> Um, 
I understand after discovering the structure of DNA, uh, James Watson uh, went to a pub to tell people that he discovered the secret of life. Uh, did you do anything like that after making your discovery? I wish. I wish. <laughs> I, I was arrogant, but I wasn't that arrogant. <laughs> that thing. But, uh, Let me ask you something, the, which is another thing that amazes me, especially about the early stages of your career. So, Joshua Letterberg, he was coming over to visit the Walter Eliza Hall Institute and work with Burnett, but he was already a very famous scientist. He already was a very famous scientist. And if, if I'm not mis mistaken, he actually won the Nobel Prize that very year, 1958. How was it that your, again, your, your first year or year and a half of your PhD, first year at this time, how did you, how did you attract the attention? How did you convince Letterberg to pay attention to, you know, this young upstart, to, uh, upstart PhD student? I suppose, going back to my Jesuit days, nine years with the Jesuits at St. Aloysius College, I was a pretty good debater. <laughs> In other words, I loved arguing, I loved challenging, I loved asking me questions, I loved spinning idiotic theories of my own about his work and that sort of thing. But I think that attracted him. And then, of course, when I came up with this idea for testing the Kermit Selection Theory, he thought that was Christmas because he was indeed enormously intrigued by Bernard's theory. No matter how much, you know, in general, no matter how much work he does, yeah, he, so right. he, yeah, so right. it wasn't. Um, he, he didn't think, even think about asking to me. Exactly, be. our convention in those days was to uh, acknowledge uh, the boss of the lab with a little phrase as a postscript, <laughs> something like, "I wish to acknowledge the useful discussions uh, and clever ideas of Sir Paul Burnett." as new contributor to this work. You know, it would not have occurred to Bernice to put his name on a paper where he hadn't done at least a third of the work. Gus, you've, you've, you've achieved many things. You've been given many uh, awards and honours and stuff like that. You've been uh, Australian of the Year. Uh, you've had the Institute named after you. You've also had a high school named after you. Uh, you won the James Cook Medal, you won the Koch Gold Medal, you're also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Victoria. You're listed as one of the 100 Australians identified as Australia's living national treasures. Uh, you're a recipient of the Centenary Medal, uh, and you're also a part of the Monash University Gold Key Society. Uh, my question is, uh, what else have you achieved? Well, <laughs> John, before you get too carried away with this, Terribly uninteresting is the market. Let me tell you about uh, a very good friend of mine called Jerry Edelman. Jerry Edelman hails from the Rockefeller Institute of New York, now the Rockefeller University of New York. He's certainly one of the most brilliant people I ever met. He's also a Nobel Prize laureate. And for some odd reason, maybe because uh, I want to be a professor there or something, he ran across my CV. He said, Gus, what is all this mess of all of these honors? <laughs> and I said, He said, Well, I know. But you know what the answer is? They run out of people to give these things to. So they give them to the ones they already know about. Which I think is very true. Of them 
that was the animal hunt for the large animals like sheep and rabbits and guinea pigs and the helicopters. It really smelled quite bad. And so the first thing, uh, well, the second thing I did after the uh, Jacques Miller was to offer Don a full floor in a uh, refurbished institute that I had built and bring him into the mainstream. That was, you know, an excellent, excellent uh, thing to do. Now let me tell you the funny part of the uh, Don Metcalf story. Uh, back, as I say, at it seemed to have this need to have his ego more or less constantly fanned. And one fine day, Mac got a Japanese on. He got the Order of the Rising Sun. So he came into after tea one day, everything happened after tea. And he wanted to show us the medal. Just been to Japan and got the medal from him, but you're only days in. Now you'll see that this is the Order of the Rising Sun, second class. But don't be disturbed. The only people who get the Order of the Rising Sun first class is the royal family themselves. <laughs> he got this medal from him, and it was a beautiful medal, it was inscribed. And he said this was the time when Japan was on the economic rise. It was very well known for me, shoddy, cheap goods. So he uh, showed this medal to Don Redcuff said, Don, you've had a lot of Japanese postdocs. Maybe you've picked up a, a few words of Japanese. Could you tell me what this inscription means? Don took the Quick as a flash said, yes, so back, it says made in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> that was the perfect one. And it was so, so good at those one-liners. Uh, and, and of course, the back was not amused. <laughs> Got into a terrible half The rest of the afternoon tea was silence. <laughs> by the Queen, I noticed that, <laughs> but everything else, uh, you, you always seem to have this exuberant smile, and um, I, I, just, I just want to know, I mean, are you, you seem like the type of guy where, uh, you look, you've been so successful from early stages of your career, two nature papers so early on, and, and then running wee high at a young age, and has everything worked out for you in your in your scientific career? Are you that that type of person that's just been so look? I feel so fortunate I've been that everything is working for you. Tremendously lucky. Yeah. I feel I've, I've a got as you've mentioned, you know, what most people deem a pretty successful career, and what you haven't mentioned. I'm enormously lucky in my family life in that I've got. A, wife and quite contrary to Linda Burnett doesn't miss my pants. <laughs> this is my pocket and, uh, and uh, try to blow me up quite the it's a very good steady. When I get a bit too pompous, she'll pull me up very, very quickly and wonderful kids. So we just have a, a very tightly knit, uh, expanding nuclear family, four kids, nine kids. So that provides a counterbalance to the professional life, which is irreplaceable. Right. It's so important to the integrity of the person. And then secondly, as far as being exuberant about the work, why wouldn't I be, you know? Uh, 
that is partly my personality, I think it comes mainly from my mother, that I'm a bit exuberant, probably a bit over the top a lot of the time. But, you know, life's been very good to me, and I feel I'd like to make life a little bit better for other people, to the extent that one can. Can you help me close it? 